So welcome and thank you for attending the second webinar in the third season of the Duchess Land Conservancy's Earth Matters series. Uh, we truly can't tell you how much we enjoy hosting these events and tonight is a unique presentation that we are truly delighted to host. Uh, I'm Brian Straniti, I'm the Outreach and Engagement Manager with the Duchess Land Conservancy. And tonight we're very excited to welcome Tom Wessels, a renowned terrestrial ecologist, author, and professor emeritus at Antioch University as he unravels mysteries in our ecosystem during this unique webinar, Understanding the Forested Landscape. In order to do this, let's go over the basic logistics about tonight's webinar, followed by a brief introduction to the Duchess Land Conservancy and to tonight's presenter. Uh, first, you might notice that you're muted uh, to ensure that there's no interruption during the presentation and conversation. Uh, second, the raised hand function is disabled for similar reasons. Uh, third, tonight Tom will be analyzing photos you have submitted and answering questions about them in real time. To do this, uh, we are not using the chat. Uh, please enter all questions into the Q&A box during the presentation, and I will present the question to Tom. You can access the Q&A box at the bottom center of your screen. If there are similar questions, we'll try to combine them based on topics and based on what we're looking at. Uh, and as I mentioned, fourth, the chat is disabled for this event. Uh, fifth, closed captioning is enabled for this event. To turn on this function, please select the CC icon located at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and finally, I'm going to hand it over to our Director of Education, Julie Hart, who will tell you a bit about our, our organization, this webinar series, and our guest presenter tonight, Julie. Thank you, Brian, and thank you all for joining us tonight. I'm Julie Hart, an ecologist and educator here at the Duchess Land Conservancy. I think many of you are probably familiar with the DLC, but for anyone who's not, let me just give you a quick overview. Uh, the Duchess Land Conservancy is a private nonprofit land conservation organization located in the Hudson Valley of New York State, and we're dedicated to preserving the farms and forests, wetlands and waterways, open spaces and wildlife habitats of Duchess County. We are an accredited land trust, and since our founding in 1985, we have worked with hundreds of landowners and protected over 46,000 acres of land. And I also want to give thanks to the Molly B. Schaefer Education Fund for sponsoring this event. We are so excited about this third season of Earth Matters, our winter webinar series. On the first Wednesday of each month through April, we'll be bringing you a fascinating speaker with lots to teach us. And this season, we're going to be learning about the history and ecology of our own Hudson Valley. I hope that these webinars will help you to see the lands around you in a new way, to read the stories that can be found in the rocks, the waters, and the trees, and to find a new appreciation for this incredible landscape we call home. So tonight, we are so thrilled to welcome Tom Wessels, author of the, for me at least, life-changing book, Reading the Forest and Landscape. Um, as a kid, I devoured Nancy Drew mystery stories. And after reading Tom's book, it was like opening a door into a new world. Uh, when you understand that the land is alive and it tells us a story of the past, it's amazing how different a walk in the woods can be. So let me tell you a little bit about Tom's background. He's a terrestrial ecologist and professor emeritus at Antioch University, New England, where he founded the master's degree program in conservation biology. Like a lot of ecologists, he's a bit of a generalist and interested in a really broad array of subjects, including forest, desert, alpine, and Arctic, Arctic ecosystems, as well as geomorphology, evolutionary ecology, complex system science, and the interface of landscape and culture. His background in ecology and complexity allows Tom to apply the principles of self-organization and co-evolution as a means to examine human systems, such as the workings of an organization or even an economic system. His books include Reading the Forested Landscape, The Granite Landscape, Untamed Vermont, The Myth of Progress, and Forest Forensics, and Granite Fire and Fog, The Natural and Cultural History of Acadia. And Tom has conducted workshops on ecology and sustainability throughout the United States for many decades. So let's get going. Tonight, our slide presentation was created using photos that you all have sent in. Some of these photos came with specific questions um, or a note about where the photo was taken and others came in without any context at all. So Tom's got quite a mixed bag to choose from here. Uh, we're gonna have a lot of mysteries to solve and I'm really excited to see what we all learn tonight. 
Um, so I'm going to stay on the screen with Tom to help with the context of the slides and page through the presentation as we go. And Brian will be monitoring the Q&A. So please feel free to type in questions and additional information if you want to chime in. And I want to thank everybody who sent in photos. We hope that we have time to get to all of them. Um, we've got an hour and a half to plow through it all. So let's get going. Let me bring up the first slide. Are you ready, Tom? I am. And I'll just add one thing before we get to the slides. Uh, Julie mentioned that a lot of the slides have questions associated with them. I'm not going to address the questions right off. I just want to look at the image and talk about what I see. And then after I've gone through everything I can see, I'm going to go and look at the questions and then I'll, I'll uh, answer those questions. But I don't want to do that off the bat because they can then frame everything. And I'd rather have an open view and just, you know, let me sort of explain what I'm seeing first. Mm -hmm. There's so much to see in every one of these photos, I think. All right, you ready? Yep. Okay, here's our first one. All right, so uh, this is obviously a tree that um, got most likely blown over uh, and uprooted. So it has a tip up with the twisted roots going over it. You can't quite see it on the slide. It looks like there's a dirt road in the right-hand side there, but I'm guessing there's a little bit of a depression where the root system, the excavated earth came up. Um, also, trees that get wind tipped like this one have trunks that will bow up like this. Um, this is really different than weight bent trees. Weight bent trees, their trunks bend over like this. So if you've ever seen like birches in an ice storm or a heavy snow that get bent over, that's from weight. Wind is more like this. So that's what I'm seeing here, a, uh, a, you know, a tree that was uprooted by wind. It's not dead. And it's going to be fine, actually. I mean, the trunk's in the water. I don't know how good that is, is for the tree. But um, if, that was, if the trunk wasn't in the water, this tree would be fine. Once a tree gets tipped like this, the root systems, the compression tension would readjust and everything, and the tree will be quite, quite fine. Um, but now I'll go to the question. So uh, what has caused the tree to grow like this? Well, that's because it was wind tipped and it's going like that. And how is it trees are so resilient? Well, they're incredibly resilient because um, they're incredibly aware of their surroundings. We often don't think of that. We think of them as being sort of static, but they have incredible sense of gravity. And once this tree got tipped, it understood how it had to readjust its root and trunk system to support it uh, in this position. So, um, you know, many things are really aware. Like for example, I don't know if you've ever seen shelf fungi growing on, let's say a, a dead upright standing tree. Um, I've taken uh, a hand level and put it on the underside of the spore surface on these things and they're dead on level because they want to have their spores be absolutely level to the ground so they don't get any water coming in and messing up the spore dispersal. Uh, I do some construction work and I'm pretty good at guessing where a level is, but if, but if I want to do dead on level work, I have to use a level. Fungi like that don't have to. That's how aware of gravity they are. So just remember, all these organisms out there are way more aware of a lot of things than we are. Uh, trees, for example, have three times as many different light sensors as we have. They're way more aware of light than we are because they're sort of stuck and that's a necessary food item for them. So. Anyway, if there's no other questions or comments, I guess we can go on to the next one. All right. All right, so I can't quite see this completely. This is definitely a limb that's coming off that, it looks like a sugar maple. And I can't tell if that has grafted back onto the back of the trunk. Um, it definitely has some fungal infection in it. Uh, I can see that by sort of the, the scar tissue that's exposed as well as the bark texture. Um, but uh, I'd like to know if that limb twisted back and grafted onto the back of the tree because I don't see it coming out anywhere off the back or anything like that. Um, so that's what I'm catching. And so if the person who took it, if they could, if they're online, if they could just answer, is that is that thing grafted in the back of that trunk? you know, up above where it uh, comes off the trunk down below? I'll let you know if and when that question okay. comes in. All right, so that's what I'm seeing there. And, you know, trees can graft onto themselves as well as each other. Uh, happens a lot through beech trees that neighboring beaches can sometimes cross their trunks and 
you know, the wood, uh, the, the trees sort of wear through the bark with, you know, a little bit of wind and then the cambial tissues graft on. So uh, this is definitely like, a, I don't know if I'd call it a burl. Uh, I can see the question, is, it, is this a type of tree burl? It's definitely um, a fungal infection that was on a limb. It's what it looks like to me. And uh, I mean, I guess the other option is it could be a burl that completely rotted away in the middle. I mean, that is a possibility. I've never seen anything like that, but that certainly is possible. And why do tree burls happen? Well, they're infections that create tumorous growth from either a virus, a bacteria, or a fungus. So that is some sort of you know infection that got in there, and the burl itself is a tumorous growth as the result of that. Uh, no response from the uh, photo submitter if they are online, but I have some general questions if you'd like to feel them in anticipation, Tom. Well, uh, if there's ones that are pertinent, sure. <laughs> well, I don't know if they're quite pertinent uh, to this image, but they're pertinent to the conversation. <laughs> um, so one is, uh, would you please explain how tree species succeed each other after land has been clear cut? Well, um, you know, we have different groups of trees. We have early successional trees, you know, like aspen or paper birch that have tiny wind blown seeds that need bare soil to establish in. Um, we've then got at the other end of the spectrum, uh, very shade tolerant trees, uh, many of which have larger seeds that can really uh, germinate well in a deep forest litter and stuff. So we have a lot of trees that are specialized to different sorts of conditions, and that allows uh, for us to change through time successionally. So there is no specific pattern to this. Um, it all depends on what seeds are present at the time of disturbance, uh, um, you know, the nature of the disturbance, whether it removed leaf litter or not, um, timing of the disturbance, all these things are factors. But yes, we get trees that uh, can fit in different points in the successional sequence based on their adaptations. Thank you. And we have a response from the individual who I believe took the photo and uh, they said, I believe the tree is grafted. Yes. Okay. So I'm guessing this is a grafted limb that then got some sort of uh, infection in it and caused that unusual growth form to it. Okay. And then we have another question. Uh, will a burl like this kill a tree eventually? Uh, generally not, but if it gets to, if it girdles all the way around the trunk, they can, but that's, uh, that is unusual. It happens, but it's unusual. Great. Thank you. All right. Next one. All right. So this is definitely a, a stone chamber of some sort. Um, my guess is the small opening, it, it's, it, this is probably indigenous, probably predates colonization. Um, you know, if it was something like a root cellar that was, you know, it'd be, it would have a taller opening where you could walk in with, you know, something you're carrying and stuff. This was meant, I think, for an individual to, to crawl into, remain seated and use it for sighting. So um, my guess is that this, maybe a solstice chamber. Uh, we have a lot of them. Well, I shouldn't say a lot, but we have a good number of them in New England. And if this is facing a little bit south of east, it'd be a winter solstice chamber. If it's facing a little bit north of east, it'd be a summer solstice chamber. And, uh, you know, Native people, uh, those times were important in many of their practices. So it was important to know the dating of that. I know that uh, for Abenaki people uh, up in Vermont, um, they would have their Feast of Dreams during the winter solstice because that was the longest night of the year. And that's where they could try to contact dead relatives and stuff. So it was important to know the date. But that's my guess is what I'm looking at here. And Tom, is there any way to reliably date a structure like this to estimate when it was built? They're hard. I mean, if it, you can try, I mean, some of them have been dated. Um, I know up in Labrador, they've gotten uh, dates on some of these going back like 8,000 years uh, during the red paint culture through carbon dating. Um, so I think you'd have to do something like that. 
it's it otherwise would be pretty hard to do it just by looking at the structure. Mm. And uh, one question that came in, uh, perhaps from somebody you know, is that or, or that you've spoken with in the past. Does this chamber remind you of the one in Putney? It's it's somewhat similar. The one in Putney uh, is different in the fact that it has a megalithic roof with really big, large stones, and that may be the case here. We just can't see it because these things were built and then covered in earth. Um, it's not quite as ornate in the front. It doesn't have the cobbled front that the one in Putney has. Um, but, you know, I, you'd have to get inside to really see if it has the megalithic roof. And most of them do because, you know, you needed something that was going to last. You couldn't just roof it over with wood. It would just rot away. But they put in huge stones as the roof system and then uh, covered it all over uh, with earth to sort of stabilize the structure. Very cool. Um this was, I was going to ask a question uh, based on my own personal interest, but this individual kind of answered it. Um, Northeast Antiques Research Association, NERA, uh, studies and inventories this type of structure. I guess that's more of a comment, but um, thinking about folks who might find this kind of stuff in indigenous communities that might want to know they were there from their uh, pre-recorded history. Um, so perhaps whoever took this photo could... Uh, reach out to the Northeast Antiquities Research Association. Um, and I do know, that, I was going to say, I do know that Dutchess County has a lot of structures like this, probably more than most of the region of the Northeast for some reason. Interesting. Yeah. Um, and then one more question about this photo. Uh, what is done in slash with a solstice chamber? It was mostly just for, you know, one of the, the spiritual people in the tribe to just monitor because, you know, oftentimes we get into this time of year, it can be overcast many mornings in a row. So it's monitoring the sun moving south and then they could actually a few days ahead of time pinpoint when that, if it was the winter solstice, when it would be. Um, so it's just for, again, monitoring and timing uh, for their calendar and for the rituals that took place around those those events. Very cool. All right. Next one, I guess. All right. All right. So we were talking about burls. This is definitely a tree. It looks like it might be an oak or it may be a basswood. I can't quite tell, but a ton of burls on it all lined up like that. In a tree like this, I think there's so much activity there. It may have killed the tree. Um because it looks like its trunk ends pretty abruptly. And it looks like the limbs that may be up there don't have a lot of life in them. But again, yes. And you can see a lot of these burls, you can see a ton of like little branches growing out of them. That's part of the tumorous growth of all the buds that are in there and everything else. And are there certain species of trees that are more prone to this type of growth? Like I'm thinking about the witch's brooms that you often see in willow trees is where yeah, I often see these. Or on high bush blueberries or something. Uh, you know, in terms of the burls themselves, um, I'd say the only tree I can think of that you, you're often going to encounter them are black, black cherries, which gets what's called mm -hmm. black nut canker. That's very, very common in black cherries. But pretty much any tree can get these. Okay. And someone just writing in about the previous photo uh, saying that they seem the... Um... Solstice chamber seems to be similar to burial chambers or long barrows that they have near Stonehenge in the United Kingdom. Interesting. And that may be a possibility. I mean, a lot of this we really don't know accurately about because there's not um, there's there's no written record. And uh, even some of the elders of tribes uh, don't have clear understandings of some of these stone structures. So they could be something like that as well. I wouldn't discount that. Thanks. And one about um, burls. Do wasps ever cause burls? Not that I'm aware of. They can cause galls, which are much stroller, st smaller features, but not, not burls like this. But it seems like kind of a parallel thing that where a wasp is creating the gall like in a leaf and this bacteria or virus is creating that other, that sort of uh, similar tumorous kind of growth in the structure of the tree itself. It's it's yeah. similar in a way. I mean, the intents may be a little bit different because the gall is not just a growth, but it's the 
home and the food source for the right. large. If if one was to cut across the tree um, where the burl is located, would it just look like the normal rings inside a tree, but just distorted? No, they're they're incredibly convoluted. That's why bowl makers often love to get burls because if you turn a bowl out of this sort of thing, it's just this incredibly mm -hmm. convoluted growth form of wood. Interesting. Yeah, anyone with a lathe is highly covetous of a good burl. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Let's go to the next one. All right. All right. So this looks like some sort of wood growing guild fungus. Um, I can't say much more about it because I'm not quite sure the species, but if the person who took it has um, a particular question about it, I'd be glad to try to answer it. I mean, it's a beautiful and shot. And how specific are fungi in terms of their host species? Are there some that are quite general and will grow in a lot of places and others that will only grow on yeah. a particular species? It, it depends on the species. So, for, exam uh, for example, the hemlock polypore will only grow on dead hemlock. That's the only thing it mm -hmm. grows on. So it's very, very host specific. But other ones are more ubiquitous, you know. Uh, the you know the birch polypore will only grow on like paper birch. So it there are some that are very specific, but others they can grow on a number of different species. Okay, ready for the next one? All right. Oh, now this looks wonderful. So this looks like again, possibly a maple or a locust, but it looks like it is grafted onto that tree next to it. Um, because I can see that low limb coming out and then you don't see it anymore. And so um, I'm guessing that is a graft. And I think the tree it's grafted onto is a completely different species. I can't tell if it's a hemlock. It looks like it could be from the foliage. I can't tell if those branches are coming off that tree. Um, but, uh, you know, trees can graft onto other trees uh, between species. And I have seen, in terms of root grafts, I have seen below ground root grafts between things like maple and hemlock, as well as yellow birch and hemlock. Um, but I guess I would ask the person, if the person who took this, if they can tell me if that tree on the left is a hemlock, because it looks like it is. And um, it looks like that is grafted, that that limb coming off that, that tree on the right is definitely connected to the tree on the left. I would like to know that for sure, I guess. While we're waiting for that answer, if the individual is online that took this photo, um, we have a question about the previous um, fungi photo. Uh, yeah. How old are trees generally when they start to support this ex kind or extent of fungal growth? It uh, it depends because a lot of this is going to be from a wound that got in the tree because a lot of these are wood parasites or uh, they're decomposers, one of the two. So if the tree already has dead wood in it, even a young age, they can come in. Um, so it, it's not related to age so much. It's related to sort of the health and condition of the tree. All right, if there's no response to my questions about that photo, we, I guess we can go on the next one. Okay, we can always go back if we hear something in a bit. All right, so this looks to be a beech or a maple. I'm guessing a beech. Um, and I <clears throat> don't have much more to say about it. Let me say the tree has branches growing in all directions and even growing back into and out of the tree. <clears throat> Why does this occur? Um, well, I'd have to actually see the growth form to see what you're thinking about here. Um, most of the growth I'm seeing in the limbs is going off on the left-hand side, which leads me to believe that um, on the right, uh, there was shade and there weren't, the tree didn't invest in limbs going out that way. And I can even see a limb coming up and crossing over and going over. So it's, this is what I'd usually call a border tree is growing on the border of an area that was open out that way and shaded back this way. And so the tree did not invest any energy in producing limbs on that side. And, and it looks like, 
Sorry, Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, we have a question coming in about the uh, the previous um, picture. How do oh. tree How do trees function uh, in wood where grafts between conifer and broadleaf graft uh, given very different compression and tension in the wood? Yeah. Well, I mean, once that graft occurs, you're not getting any new growth of, let's say, this tree that's on the right hand side. It's like that limb now is connected. And then it's just a sharing of nutrients and moisture. Um, but the wood itself is kept separate. It's just the graft forms and it's sort of a conduit for, you know, nutrients, moisture to move back and forth between the two trees. All right, I guess we can go on the next one. All right. Um, this looks like it may be a barberry. I can't really tell. Um, so I guess I look at the question. Oh, is there any way of getting rid of barberry and multiflora roads short of digging them out by the roads? It's the best way. I mean, if you're really fastidious, you can clip them down to ground level and then like every couple weeks go back and clip anything coming up if you do that for a number of years you will get rid of them but you have to be persistent in your clipping um and if it's a, a big thing that would be a real hassle to take out by the roots that might be the best way to go about it i uh a lot of these things if it's just the one specimen whatever else if you are fastidious about it you can get rid of it by repeated clipping but you got to do it frequently as new shoots come up clip them off and what you'll do is you'll starve the root system uh, at that point, and then kill kill the specimen after a number of years. It must kind of depend on the magnitude of the infestation, shall we call it? Yes. There, there are definitely forests with a solid understory of barberry that's, that just goes that is, for acres and acres. Yeah, that's different. I, if this yeah. is just one specimen, that's what I was talking about. I mean, yeah. a lot of these things root clone. So if you get uh, you know a large area of root clones, no amount of clipping is going to do it because they'll just keep coming up. And actually, sometimes that can be detrimental. So for example, with Eurasian bittersweet, if you've got a lot of Eurasian bittersweet, one of the worst things you can do is just go out and clip the stuff because the root clone explodes and so much more above ground growth happens. Um, you can clip it, but you'd have to do it in the fall, like in October when everything is being drawn back down into the root clone. And then usually you need to herbicide the cut stumps and that will then kill the root system. But just clipping a lot of times, there's a lot of this stuff is not going to do it. Yeah, it is a lot of work. Yeah, yeah. So the best thing to do is nip it in the bud. I mean, when invasives just first start to come in, you can get at them and just weed them out pretty easily. So that's always the best thing. If you're just starting to see something move in, take care of it, then it'll be much easier and much less impactful uh, than waiting. All right, I guess next one. All right. All right. So these are some nice forest grown trees. Uh, the one on the left, very nicely forest grown because it's growing straight up, no lower limbs. The one to the right has what looks like a real bend in it. Um, so the trunk is going up and then it bends out like this and goes up again. That's usually the result of a crown breakage where the original trunk broke off and that branch sort of facing us on that tree on the right that bows upwards was the, the lowest branch just below the break and took off to become the new main truck growing up. Um, so that's what I'm getting in this slide. Um, so let's see, when trees grow so close together, branches one tree can rub against another tree nearby. Yes, they can. How much thinning of trees should we be doing? Um, so yes, this, I think that they're talking about, I, I see a limb here that's rubbing against the tree. And if, you know, that limb was alive and it gets through the bark on each the the branch as well as the trunk they can graft like we may have seen in the previous slide um you know trees take care of themselves really well i mean if we can thin we don't have to it's a question i mean any management we do in forests are for outcomes that we desire um basically uh forests can do just fine on their own uh, the trees can do fine on their own. Um, you know, I think that 
There's nothing wrong with managing forests, but let's be clear, we're doing it for outcomes that we're desiring. Uh, it's not like the forest saying, come in here and do this for me. It's not. <laughs> um, so uh, let's, yeah. So th that's all I'd say about that. All right, ready for the next slide? All right, so it looks like we got maybe some grapevine in here. Grape is a native species. Um, and uh, generally it's not a problem to trees on edge areas. It can become a problem and we can become almost invasive like, but in a forest interior, it actually can uh, be some benefit to a forest because uh, if grapevines get up in the canopy, they can kill a tree, but they can open up canopy gaps, which allow a lot of other stuff to move in. Um, I should also mention that grape is one of our few species where individuals can actually migrate through a forest. So the way this works is if a grape grows up on the top of a tree, you know, covers it over, uh, you know, shuts off its photosynthetic gain and kills the tree, eventually when that tree comes down, that grapevine, the upper branches of it will touch the ground. At those points, they can reroot there disconnect from their original trunk system and start growing up again. So in a forest that has always been forested, we can't really age individual grapevines because we don't know how many times they might have hopped through that forest. So um, it's one of our few plants that actually individuals can move uh, like that. So let's see, I've cut the base of many of these vines. Is there more that can be done to control this apparently invasive plant? I this doesn't look like it's bittersweet to me because it's not uh, spiraling up. I think it's grape, and um, again, if yeah, if you really are caring about your trees, you can clip the vines. But like I said, a lot of these can root clone and come back. Um, so I guess it's you know the decision of the individual what they want to do with this. But I'm not sure these are invasive. Uh, if this was bittersweet, we'd see it being spiraling up the trees, and I'm not noticing that. I really want to see the hundred year long time lapse video of grapes sort of galloping across a forest land like that. <laughs> yeah, it would be pretty interesting to see. You'd have to use a really long stop <laughs> yeah. frame camera. <laughs> All right, if there's no questions or comments, we can go on the next one. All right. All right, so this pit was definitely an excavation of material uh, for some reason. Uh, someone took stuff out of here. Actually, this slide and the one before it, I'm looking at the ground, the ground beyond the pit. When you look at the image on the left, you can see it's really flat and smooth and even. There's a stone fence in the background. So uh, this was agricultural land at one time, most likely a crop field or a hay field. And then um, <clears throat> probably at the time of abandonment or after abandonment, someone went back into the site and excavated material uh, out of this pit that could have been used for road or trail construction mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, but you know why they did, I can't really tell. All right, pits in the wood look to be dug. They are duck, all are oval shaped, the long end pointing uphill and southwest. Um, I think it's more or less that it's just easier to extract material downhill. So they're just digging it out and taking it down as they went. Um, but where it was going, I can't really mm -hmm. say. But I mean, someone was putting attention into getting material out for something that they were filling in somewhere. Okay. And there's actually a series of photos. So there's these two showing these two pits and then a couple more photos showing additional pits. Mm -hmm. And lastly these two photos showing the road bed. And this is, I'm not sure if it's uphill or downhill from those pits. Yeah, so that is definitely a road bed because you can see a road cut there, a road cut, um, the slope comes down and then drops and then the road bed is level. Uh, we can also get plow tears at the bottom of crop fields on a slope, but then the profile is the slope comes down and the terrace goes out and the drop is like that. So this is a roadbed, and it could have been that some of that material was used to fill in that roadbed um, at some point in time. 
And the individual who submitted the photo said, it looks like a possible old farming road. Uh, that's what I suspected all along, but thank you so much for your uh, thoughtful knowledge. Yeah, no, it, I'm sure it was a farm road to access these either crop fields or hay fields that were in here. And I'm sure it was one of the two. If we could see the stone walls surrounding the site, we'd probably get the answer. If there's a lot of small fissites, rocks in the stone walls, that means they abutted a crop field. These crop fields are the only things that generate and necessitate the removal of small rocks. Mm -hmm. uh, small rocks cannot surface out of forests or out of lawns or out of hay fields because all those places have perennial roots that stitch the ground together as a unit and freeze and thaw cycles, <clears throat> even as the ground expands and then settles, the roots hold the rocks in place. But in a crop field, without any perennial roots, freeze and thaw cycles slowly move rocks to the surface and even small ones get picked out. So uh, to figure out what the previous use of this was agriculturally, you'd need to go around those stone walls and the edges. If there's a number of small fist-sized rocks associated with them, then at one time it was a crop field. Okay, yeah, the only photo that has the visible stone wall, I think, is this one on the top left, and it's not, can't really tell it's from the photo hard. what size the rocks are. Nope, not from here. And I don't see it in the other photos. All right, ready to move on? Okay. All right, so here we have definitely a downed log. My guess is it may be hemlock. There's another hemlock besides it. Um, looks like we have maybe a birch growing up the, the right hand. I mean, the left hand shot shows a birch growing up. Um, so this could become a nurse log. Generally, hemlock is not good for that. It doesn't decay slowly enough. The most common form of nurse log we get are from white pine trees, which after about 25 years, shed their bark and get a nice moss coating like we have in the image on the right. And then they rot very slowly from the outside and usually become great germination sites for small seeded trees like black birch or hemlock that seed into these things. So um, it may be that if this is a white pine next to the hemlock on the right, that will become a nurse log. But it, I'm I'm guessing it may be a hemlock because I think at this point we'd see a lot more tree growth in it than we're seeing right now. All right, ready for the next slide? Okay. All right, so this looks like a weevil hit white pine. Uh, White pine trees that are growing in full sunlight when they're young, usually less than 15 years of old, 15 years of age, develop a terminal shoot, the upper shoot, that's usually about the diameter of a finger. And white pine weevils only seek out pines with a big terminal shoot like that because they lay their eggs on it, the eggs hatch out and the larvae drill into the shoot, kill it, and then the tier of limbs down below takes off to become the new trunk. So. This tree was definitely growing all by itself out in the open when it was very young, lost its terminal shoot, and then it looks like four or five, actually five of the limbs took off to grow up to be uh, the new trunks. And then it got hit again. If you look at the sort of middle trunk towards the left, it forks again higher up. So it got hit by another weevil. Um, its leader got killed and then just two of the trunks made it up. So, um, this is pretty common, especially again in sites uh, that were abandoned after agriculture. White pine would come in and often get hit by weevils. So if you go into a forest and you see a lot of weevil hit pines, um, it's a pretty good indication they were the sort of first cohort of trees to move into a, to a once abandoned agricultural site. It does seem to be common. I find we run across these uh, quite a lot out in the woods. It's very, very common because, uh, you know, white pine wasn't as common a species when, you know, uh, colonial settlement started here. But with our agricultural practices and then all the land abandonment, it, it just took off. So there's a lot mm -hmm. more pine in the landscape today than there was probably in the past. And someone is wondering, will the weevil kill the tree, a whole tree or just the tops? 
guess the very terminal shoot, it's actually a very mild, mild parasite. It, it changes the growth form of the tree, but uh, doesn't change its longevity or anything else like that. And actually, you know, probably a number of years ago, trees like this would be ignored in logging. It might have helped the tree, <laughs> but uh, it, yeah, now, it's yeah, it's a very mild form of parasitism. And does this type of growth in any way impact the tree's ability to withstand like heavy snowstorms and ice storms that might cause trunk breakage? Would it make it more or less susceptible than a single trunked tree? Uh, I don't know if it'd make it any more or less susceptible. I think, okay. in other words, once the tree starts growing, it readjusts everything as best it can. Yeah, they're incredibly adaptable. Yeah. All right, ready for the next one? Okay. Oh, so this is definitely a spruce, it looks like, that has some galls growing out around the base of each of its dead limbs those are all dead limbs and you got gall growth coming out of it there i don't know if i've ever seen a spruce with the galls arranged quite like this but um that's what's going on here so yeah so i guess uh, you know i don't see many norway spruce up this way so that might be it it might be something that's more specific to norway spruce but that's what it is it's it's gall growth again Probably my guess would be fungal infection in this case from fungi getting in those dead limbs and then growing uh, at the base of them. So is this something that you'll see more on the lower limbs that the tree has already kind of self pruned and they've died off as opposed to the live limbs at the top of the tree? Yeah, that would be a good guess. I would. Okay. I would yeah. Probably... Can't really see the top of the tree, but. No. Okay. Someone is asking about the previous slide. Uh, is it obvious to you this isn't a coppice tree from logging? Uh, white pines can't coppice. Our only conifer that if you cut it that can stump sprout is pitch pine. So yeah, this is this is weevil damage and not, not coppicing from a cut white pine. Cool. And then about the um uh the galls on the pre on the other picture, uh, why galls and not burrs? Well, burr can be another name for a gall. So it just, you know, it, they're, oh, excuse me. I didn't, I said gall, that's wrong. No, not a gall. You're right, burrs or cankers, I should say, yeah. Uh, galls are basically caused again by insects laying eggs. So this is not a gall, my, my mistake. Hmm. All right, anything else on that or should we move on? I think we can move on. Okay. Oh, it looks like, is this a lot of, I was I actually we... able to identify, these are um, spring Lily snowflakes. The... It's a oh. leucogum, leucogum vernum. Oh. We we're able to identify that, yeah. Great, because I was, it was looking like Lily of the Valley, but the leaves are way too narrow. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm not that familiar with this species, but uh, when usually I start seeing wildflowers like this, I think I'm looking at pretty calcium and rich soils. Is that the case with this one? Do you know, Julie? Not sure about the soils here. It's uh -huh. an area of forest that was part of an estate at one point. So it's possible these escaped from cultivation, but they really flourished it entirely carpets that section yeah. of woods yeah i'll say so i mean that makes sense in a way i mean i've seen this with vinca you know um do the same thing where you have it planted then it can just take over the understory of a forest like this so i guess it's very similar sort of thing mm -hmm. i don't have much else to say about it but um if there's other questions or comments i could try to address it Okay, we'll see if anybody writes in. In the meantime, ready to move on to the next one? Sure. Okay. Oh, definitely uh, an icing event when the water dropped dramatically. So I'm I'm wondering if this happened after like a heavy rain event. It got cold, froze, and then the water drained out, uh, leaving these ice uh, sort of rims hanging on to the trunks of the trees. And it looks like it happened in stages because I can see this one young tree sort of in the middle of the slide that has two rims of ice on it. So the first one formed, <coughs> excuse me, and the water is the highest level, then it dropped, froze again, and then dropped further. 
wow, spring hydrology as a force to be reckoned with, apparently. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Any questions on that? Um, uh, individual who likely submitted the photos. Yes, and it did happen over approximately three events over two weeks. Thank you. Well, I could believe that. I've seen wow. similar things up here where I live uh, on MDI and uh, the Wild Gardens of Acadia. This is not an uncommon phenomenon to happen in the wintertime or, you know, uh, so I've seen similar things up here. Yeah, I've actually seen it happen uh, in a vernal pool area and someone's saying, I wonder if that's McCabe Forest. I see it there every late winter. So. Uh -huh. All right, I guess right. we go to the next one. Ready? Yep. All right, so two images, one of some sort of a polypore coming out of some the ground with some rocks. I mean, I usually don't see polypores like that. They usually grow off root systems when I see something like that. So I don't know if there's a tree nearby. And then we've got this rock that has on the right with some very nice crustose lichen growth on it. Um, so I don't know if there's specific questions that the person who had that took these slides had. Um, that's sort of what I'm picking up on here. Yeah, these didn't come with any specific questions in the email. I think just wondering what you see here. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, different rock types. The rock on the the right looks like it may be basalt that's been you know really tumbled in the glaciers, but great lichen colonies on it. <clears throat> the rocks on the left look more like they're schist, and then we have this polypore growing up out of the midst of them. And again, something like that is probably growing off the root of a nearby tree, I'm guessing. And you can see the lichens in the left photo are quite different from the lichens in the right yeah. photo, which... Yeah, we're getting into some folios lichens there. I can see mm -hmm. that the greenish one on the you know, right-hand side. Um, while the ones on the rock on the right are all crustos lichens and don't have any clear component to them. And uh, our friend who submitted the photos said they just wanted an ID on the lichen, but they just thought the uh, the fungi was very fascinating. <laughs> I would I would have to agree. <laughs> I would agree too. That that's what took my attention first. But yes, so the crustos lichens we have you know four morphological forms forms of lichens, crustos. <laughs> excuse me, look like they've been painted onto the rock. They don't really have any vertical features. Folios, like the one that's on the left-hand slide, on the right-hand side of it, that, that sort of greenish one, look a little bit more leaf-like. They're not completely anchored totally on the rock. They're anchored at their centers. And then we can get upward-growing lichens that are fruticose lichens, like reindeer lichen that have upward-growing stems and stuff. And then the last group of squamulose lichens, which grow in pincushion shapes. But definitely the, the best shot here is of the crustose lichens on the right-hand slide. I really want to see a photo of a squamulose lichen, just so we can say that word a couple more times. That is a fun <laughs> word. <laughs> yeah. Well, All pretty, right. I mean, they look like pincushions. You know, they, they're they pincushion shape and... Um, and I've seen them get up to, you know, probably, you know, two or three inches in height on older ones. All right. Ready for the next slide? All right. Obviously, an old hay cutting piece of equipment that got dumped uh, next to this double trunk tree. Um, all right. The farm was already embedded in the tree 20 years ago. I wouldn't doubt that. I mean... You know, once something's in place like these trees are going to grow out and whatever they you know, encounter, they just sort of encapsulate into their growing form. So it's not uncommon to see farm equipment like this sort of, yeah, embedded into the trees that they're, they were dumped near. Yeah, and this person sent a second photo, which unfortunately we couldn't use. The lighting wasn't really good enough to see what it was, but it was similar, a, another piece of farm equipment that was kind of embedded in a tree. Uh, we have a question uh, related to lichens and um, the previous photo. How fragile are lichens? We often see them hiking and I'm wondering about avoiding them to preserve them or if they're more robust. Um, the crustose lichens, like the ones on the rock on the right, uh, you can walk on them. 
uh, if the soles of your boots are dry and you won't have you won't impact them at all um, if your soles are wet and you've picked up sand and you start walking on them then the sand on your boots can start eroding those crustose lichens but the other three growth forms when they are dry if you step on them while hiking you're going to crush them um, so I tell people when I'm out on rock outcrop communities and stuff, I teach them right away about crustose lichen. Say, you know, if you need to step on any lichen growth, step on these. If your boots are dry, you're not going to harm them at all. But the other three forms, because they do have upward growing growth forms, if you step on them, they'll crunch. And you can tell right away because if you walk on them on a dry day, you'll hear crunching noises. And that's not a good sign. So yes, uh, try to stay on bare rock or rock that just has the crustose lichens on it. And related to the um, the next photo with the uh, old farm equipment in the tree, is there a way to remove these old iron pieces from trees without harming them? Or is it best to just leave them to grow into the trees? It's, I mean, you're going to do some damage to the tree removing them for sure. So if, you know... It's your choice. You could do it, but yes, you will you will harm the tree to some degree because you're going to create a pretty good wound to get that material out of them. And does the, it harm the tree at all to have metal embedded in it? Does that affect its sort of circulatory system at all? I, you know, it's a good question. I can't say definitively, but I've seen so many trees that have stuff like this in them. They seem fine. So I'm guessing, you know, if there is <clears throat> any impact, it's pretty minor. Mm -hmm. Would the tree grow kind of scar tissue around it as if it was growing around an injury? That's a good question, too. I've never really dug in there to look at what it looks like, but it's almost like, you know, if a tree is growing next to a rock, it can wrap around the rock. It can. Um, so it's just that's what it's doing. It's just growing around this thing that's there and continuing its growth. Yeah. Again, incredibly adaptable and resilient creatures. Trees. Are. Yeah. They've been around a long time. They figured it all out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> all right. Ready for the next slide? And again, this looks like more farm equipment that was dumped on a stone wall. This stone wall looks like it's only made of big stones. So most likely a stone structure that um, was associated with a hay field or crop field. I mean, it may be that there's more to this. It might be a foundation of some sort. I can't tell from the little bit amount of stonework I'm seeing. So if whoever took it could tell us if this is a wall or if it's part of a larger structure that might help, but. Um... Okay, and the same person sent in a couple more photos too that are coming up next. Shall we move on to the next one? They might, because they might be, you know, another, you know, they might be an extension of this or something. So, yeah, let's yeah. just see. This looks like, no, this looks like, well, it's either a stone wall or it may be a, a paddock or something. I can see a corner in there, and I can't tell if that's an enclosed space or not. Um, if it is an enclosed space, then it may have been just a paddock for holding, uh, you know, livestock in. If it's just the corner of a wall system, then I think, yes, we're looking at a wall that was either a budding a hay field or a pasture, but not a crop field, because this is what's called a single stack wall, where you get one stack of larger stones laid up. Uh, usually crop fields, as I mentioned, will have a lot of small stone embedded in, or there'll be a double stack wall with two large stacks of big stones on the outside and then infilled with small stone on the inside. Um, but if there's another shot that comes to this, that might even enlighten us a bit more about the stonework. Yeah, this is the third yeah. one. I'm not sure if it's a photo of the sure. same place, but I think it is actually. I think it's the same thing. So this is either, I don't see an opening in it. So, I mean, this may be the foundation for a barn or an outbuilding. It's not a cellar hole, but it's above ground, but it, it looks like the foundation work for a barn or some sort of an outbuilding that was not a, a house uh, would be my guess. And I think that is, you know, probably what we we're looking at in all three shots. Yeah, I think the previous shot was of what we're looking at in the top right corner, right. that that right. corner of the wall. You can see that same ash tree yeah. right there. Yeah. If this was a panel, there'd be a clear opening going in and out, but I think it's foundation work for an outbuilding. 
And the individual who submitted the photo said it is an enclosed space with metal pieces piled on top, and they are always bewildered by the backbreaking, time-consuming effort <laughs> needed to build these stone walls in the woods. How <laughs> yeah, did, no, how... it is an incredible amount of work. I mean, I uh, in central New England, um, we have I know about uh, one hundred and twenty thousand miles of stone fencing, and I've calculated if if you took all that rock it would be enough to circle the equator about five times and uh, <laughs> piled it all it'd be about five times as massive as all the pyramids in egypt uh incredible amount of work it was all done in basically about a 40-year time frame so it's an incredible amount of work that was done wow uh and then someone just asking what kind of stone this is well this is all some sort of a metamorphic stone probably as some sort of a metamorphic schist that it looks like. The state forest is in kind of the northern end of the Catskills. It's kind of a bit west of Albany, across the river. Yeah, that's all metamorphic in there, so that would be my guess. And then another question about the uh, equipment embedded in the tree, if you don't mind. Uh, just someone wondering how the tree opens itself to wrap around these things instead of pushing it away uh well it's a good question i mean it was embedded enough that it wasn't easily moved so the tree just <laughs> went around it <clears throat> i often see this in signs like no trespassing old metal no yeah. trespassing sides that people nail the trees so they, yeah they're hard hard to move out of the way once they're nailed to you yeah or barbed wire the same mm -hmm. thing All right, ready to move on? All right, so this is definitely a weight bent tree, got bent over. Uh, the trunk that's going up was the lowest living branch that took off to grow up. Uh, sometimes this tree doesn't look old enough, but sometimes these trees were pointer trees used by indigenous people that would point to significant features. I don't think this tree is old enough um, to be that, just looking at the tree itself, <clears throat> but definitely bent over the trunk that went out along the ground was shaded. The tree discontinued energy going into it and then invested all the energy in the lowest branch uh, on the trunk to grow up to be the new growth. And of course, <clears throat> this tree is gonna be fine. Um, it will restructure its root systems, tension, compression wood, all of that. And it can be an old growth specimen and still be standing like this, not any problem at all. So what it could deform this tree was weight of some sort, something bent the tree over, could have been caused by a tra traumatic event or it might have occurred gradually. No, this was not gradual. This happened all at once. Um, tree sips atop a thrust sheet with a bedrock and layered nice sandstone quartzite. The default have contributed deformation. No, this was definitely another tree falling on it, snore ice loading, something like that, that bent it over. And it did happen all at once. And um, then the tree readjusted its growth form. And here it looks like just the one tree, but um, I've seen forests like up north where they had that terrible ice storm in 1998, yeah. where the only straight trees are the trees that are less than 25 years old because everything else either bent or broke during right. that storm and that storm covered most of northern new york northern vermont northern new hampshire and a lot of southern canada so yeah. a lot of very bent trees up there <laughs> huge amount in canada quebec really got hit hard i mean i remember seeing they got like four and a half inches of ice loading and seeing these huge transformer towers just look like they melted under the weight from all the ice on the the power lines going into them and stuff and uh I, I remember reading about one woman who had a greenhouse where she was propagating rare and endangered plants in Quebec and was without power for, I think, eight weeks and kept a wood stove going and wow. hand watering all those plants to keep them alive. So it was quite the event. Yes. All, all of us North Country folks still refer to it as the ice storm with capital letters. <laughs> it is, because we've never had another one like it. Yeah. yeah. All right, and the same person sent in a couple more photos. Here's the next one. <clears throat> well, this is a tree that definitely 
lost its central trunk and then the two lower branches just below that breakage took off to grow up. I'm not sure what would have done this, uh, but again, the tree is gonna be fine. Uh, it just has readjusted after losing its you know, central trunk. Now it has two from the lower branches that took off after that breakage event. It's quite a distinctive shape. It's a very tuning it, fork shaped tree. <laughs> it is, yeah. All right, and here's the third one that they sent in. Wow. Um, so I, there's a cave in there. I can't, it looks like it was, I mean, is this like a tunnel going through that for a road system or something? Yes, it was described as a tunnel that was carved out in the late 1800s. What if that was for a rail line, for railroad? It looks also, like it. Yeah. And then um, I can see something highlighted. It looks like a, a hemlock growing on the bedrock um, that seems to be doing just fine. Uh, and the question is what caused the tree to grow at such an angle? Well, it's just that when it grew up, there was some soil in that area. Its roots grew out, that's all eroded away. And that's where its trunk grew up from. Um, so again, it's fine. It's well anchored in the bedrock and everything else and it'll do just fine uh, as it continues to grow. And I just want to take a moment to give a tip of the hat to the person who sent these photos in for always providing us with the essential geological information about the <laughs> type of bedrock that is present. That is awesome. Yeah. All right. Anything else on this one? Any questions coming in? Uh, I don't have any. Not at the moment. No. Okay. All right, so here we have, it looks like we could be next to a road cut or something. I can see a stone fence running off in the background behind it. Um, and uh, it looks like the forest on the far side of that stone fence is a lot younger than the one on this side. So it could be different abandonment times. I'm just basing that on the fact that it's much denser back there with a lot of younger, denser trees. All right. It does not look like land was cultivated on either side of the wall. Were sheep grazed here? Could have been sheep. Um, one thing to really look at closely on a site like this is the ground. If the ground is, even if it's sloping, is not smooth and even on the surface, it has like dips and lumps and stuff, that would be <clears throat> residual pit and mound or pillow and cradle topography. It means it was never plowed. And if that's the case, then this would definitely have been pastured for livestock. Uh Generally, with stone fences in the region, <clears throat> we're looking at sheep because by the time we get into market dairy farming, uh, barbed wire has already come in, and it's much easier to lay a fence like that than building stone fencing. But the key would be to look at the surface topography of the ground on both sides of the wall. If it's smooth and even, it could have been hayed, although I am seeing a rock scattered throughout the site on the left-hand side of the wall. That would make paying or cropping a bit more difficult, not impossible. But um, again, if the ground has surface topography that's irregular, then yes, definitely pasture. And this person also provided some additional context there. I just couldn't fit all the text on the slide. Um, they're wondering, with so many stones still in this field, I've wondered why a wall was built here. Um, wondering if sheep fever ended and they abandoned the fields with all the rocks still in them after just a few seasons of clearing the stones. Well, if the, the rocks look pretty big, if they're big, a lot of those big ones, they just couldn't move. So they just got left, even in crop fields or hay fields. So uh, and the stone fences were built strictly for fencing to keep livestock in one area in pastures or out of crop fields or hay fields. Um, you know, that's I mean, originally the fencing would have been split rail zigzag wood fencing, but with the massive deforestation that happens in the 1800s with so much land being opened into agriculture, there's not enough wood left. So they have to go and get stones to replace the wood fencing with stone fencing. And can you talk a little bit about sheep fever, which this person had mentioned in their question? Well, sheep fever was something that's really more specific to uh, central New England Getting down to Dutchess County, I mean, I'm sure there are sheep down there, but down there, you know, you were colonized a lot early and your whole agricultural economy was much more diversified. Central New England had just been colonized uh, after the French and Indian Wars in the late 1700s, and um, it was very rural and there wasn't 
access to large urban centers. So there wasn't a lot of market farming of uh, crops and things. So sheep fever was the first real big market farming opportunity for people in central New England. And it exploded uh, with uh, basically three things happening right around 1810. The first is uh, Napoleon going to war against Spain in 1806, and the Spanish had bred this special breed of sheep called the Merino that they didn't want anyone to have, so they had an embargo on the sheep. Uh, but it just happened that the uh, ambassador to Portugal at the time was a Vermonter named William Jarvis, and he was able in 1810 to smuggle out 4,000 Merino sheep and bring them back to his Vermont farm. So that got Merino sheep in New England. Two years later, with the War of 1812, tariffs went up on all imported woolens, giving anyone who could make woolen textiles a great market advantage in this part of the world. And then two years after that, the power loom was invented, which allowed, uh, allowed mass industrial production of textiles. So those three things happening in that four-year time span basically uh, turned central New England into this wool-growing mania a region of the world where those 4,000 million sheep swelled to about 6 million in the next 30 years. So it was really a dramatic, dramatic sort of time with incredible amount of land clearing. About 60% of all the land was cleared of forest to make pasture for these sheep in that time frame. So uh, a pretty dramatic, but like many things, a boom and bust event. And it went bust in the middle 1840s as the tariffs were lifted and all of a sudden, the, the farms weren't as productive anymore, and it just it collapsed. Wow. And so the decline of sheep farming was as abrupt as it started. It didn't just kind of oh. tail off. It just stopped. It, just, it stopped very quickly. Okay. And yes. what happened after the sheep? Well, then, like uh, I know in Vermont, which was really big in the sheep fever craze, half the Vermont, Vermonters left. Uh, between 1845, 1855, Vermont became only half as populated as it was before. And they all went out to places like Ohio and took their sheep with them. And then the sheep started growing, moved west. Oh, okay. So that was kind of like the first wave of abandonment of agricultural properties. It okay. Was. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Anything else on this slide? The same person sent in several others. Okay. Well, let's look at some more of it as they might add on to this. Again, this is a <clears throat> looks like the corner of a, a fence that could have been for pasture or hayfield. Again, single stack stone wall, so not a crop field. If the whole thing looks like this, so how did sheep fever encourage stone walls? Again, uh, just huge amount of deforestation. There was no longer wood available for fencing. Yes, uh, they the the soil did have uh, uh, grass on it. So like. Um, when pastures were first opened up, they would take forests, they would clear cut them. The first forage were the stump sprouts of all the hardwood trees. Once everything was denuded and everything killed off, then the livestock were pulled out and grass seed was sown in. And then the next year they were brought back in. <clears throat> where grass is not able to keep the stones underneath like tree roots. Yes, so um, uh, grass can hold stones in place like tree roots. Uh, but if you get really big stones, they can't, and they can come up. But um, there was so much rock coming out of the, all the crop fields that were being worked at that time that a lot of this rock came out of them and was brought in. They'd, you know, they'd gotten dumped in stone dumps. And then when there's no longer enough trees to make fencing, the stones are brought back from the stone dumps and built into these stone fences. Oh, okay. And they kind of elaborated this a little bit more in their question. If the grasses weren't able to hold the stones in the ground, why the necessity of moving stones to the edge of the field if you aren't plowing it? Was it just a matter of any stones coming up to the surface equals less grass to feed on for the sheep? Well, that that means that too. But a lot of this stuff was not coming out of necessarily the pastures, coming out of crop fields, hay fields that had been plowed previously and the rock came out of there. Mm -hmm. And again, <clears throat> The rock is the essential building material for fencing now because there's no longer wood. So this is what they could use to keep animals in pastures or out of crop fields or hay fields. Wow. The evolution of farming in the New England area has been really fascinating and convoluted, hasn't it? It has been. I've often thought like if colonization of this country had happened from the West Coast coming east and 
people had come across, expanded across all those prairie soils free of rock with deep, rich soil. And then they started moving up into northeastern part of the country in New York and New England. I think they would have stopped. <laughs> now we'll let that go. That's all right. We'll just keep the good farmland and let that, you know, become a big national park or something. <laughs> Yes, it is a rocky place. I used to do soil science, and one of the tests that I was doing was measuring bulk density, and I had to um, basically weigh the soil and the sample. And just for giggles, I also weighed the rocks that mm -hmm. were contained in that sample. And the rocks weighed more than the soil. Oh, yes. And I reported that to the scientist that I was working for, and he said, so it's not so much that we have rocky soils as that we have dirty rocks. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and I had to laugh and admit that that is definitely true. <laughs> uh, we have a stone wall question uh, coming in. Many of the stone walls I've seen don't seem that they're tall enough to contain livestock. Were there any wooden pieces or features in included on top uh, to increase the height of the walls? Yeah. So standard stone walls went up to about waist height, maybe three feet in height, because it's one thing lifting a rock like this, quite another doing that. <laughs> So they go up to about waist height, and then they'd use cross poles and a rail across the top, and that usually is adequate for keeping livestock in that combination. All right, ready for the next slide? All right, so this looks like a stone dump. Um, and if there's a lot of small stones in that, it probably would have abutted a crop field. Uh, but this was an area where stone came out of some working landscape and was dumped here. Uh, oftentimes, this is common over embankments, which this looks like this is. So um, that's what is going on there. So do cairns like this date <clears throat> from when land was a man of agriculture, managed farming, and pilling rocks collected in spring in uh, the snow wall. Yeah, I think that the, these were all, again, related to the farming activity. Um, <clears throat> this is not a cairn because it's not laid up stone. So cairns usually are intentionally laid up. This is just a, a, a dump where the stones are just dumped in a pile in this area. And they're coming out of, again, mostly hay fields or crop fields that were being plowed. Okay, any other questions coming in on this one? Not at the moment. All right. And here's the last photo that this person has sent in. Well, this uh, is obviously a stone fence going over a stream. I can see another section in the background of the stone fence crosses a stream. So um, just a nice way to have fencing that allows the water to move through. But that's pretty elegant. Now, you don't see this very commonly. So yeah, how often have you seen stone wall? Not commonly, not like this. So this is... Uh, Pretty cool, actually. And what would be the purpose of that? <laughs> it's not really a bridge. No, it's just allowing the water to move through without blocking it up and flooding, you know, the pasture or the crop field or whatever. Was oh, up. but still being a fence that's going to keep things from moving from one side to the other. I see. I li things that are big enough that they can't fit through that hole anyway. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. So, and obviously... The dog on the right is, or the left is really appreciating the stonework here because it's very mm -hmm. nice. Design. Yeah. Yeah. If I had to assign a purpose to this structure, I would say it is to entertain this dog. <laughs> All right. Here's the next one. All right, so this was a piece of wood that got attacked by carpenter ants and those were all the galleries they carved out of it. Um, so they had been in there a good amount of time and had excavated a lot of material for their galleries for raising young and storing food and things like that. So that's what we're looking at here. And it's interesting that the outer wood was very, very sound. So usually they'll only go into wood that is decayed wood because it's easier to excavate. Healthy green wood they won't touch because it's just too much work, like we can see right here. And now are these galleries going to become homes and habitats for other sort of invertebrates and, and microbes? I am sure they do. I mean, I don't know much about that, but I'm sure this becomes, yeah, a great place for all sorts of other organisms to live in and grow in. You can't beat the elegance of the architecture, that's for sure. No. No. <laughs> all right, and here's our next one. All right, so this is definitely really fine stonework. You usually don't see stonework this good. I can't tell if this 
it looks like it might be an enclosure, so it may be a foundation wall. Um, because I think I see a wall behind the foreground wall. I think that's what I'm looking at. But um, very nicely laid stonework. It's lasted well. So <clears throat> I'm guessing possibly a foundation wall. I'd have to see the whole thing, though. So did she send another one with this? Several, but they're not of the stone wall. Oh. But that wall has a lot of different sized rocks in it from extremely large to yeah. just fist sized rocks. Well, I don't, there's some fist sized, but mostly are bigger stuff. And again, it's laid up so well. This is not, I don't think, just a utilitarian wall. That's why I think it's probably a foundation wall mm. that it had to be sound. Okay. And then there's also a photo of this structure, which I don't know if it's connected at all with the previous photo. Well, this now. You know, I'd have to see this structure. This is the sort of thing that could have been used as a root cellar. There are some that were made like this, but it could be um, an indigenous chamber of some sort. I have to see the interior structure of it, but it's pretty elegant, whatever it is. Yeah, it's very well built. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions on that one? No, but it's. I'd like to. I'd like to visit this if I could someday because I'd, it would be interesting to really take a look at it. Yeah. All right, and then we have a few photos of mushrooms. <laughs> oh well, the one. Oh, so I was talking about the hemlock polypore. That's the one that is on the right. That is host specific to dead uh, hemlock, and I should mention that there is a beetle that forages and mates on this polypore that is host specific to this polypore. So we have a, it's called the pleasing fungus beetle. I've only seen it once, um, but that's a really unique situation. We have a host specific fungus and then a host specific insect that lives on that host specific fungus. So that's pretty cool. So that's what's on the right. The left-hand shot, I am not sure what the fungus is, but I'm guessing it's growing off of the root system of this tree. So it's either parasitic or if there's dead material down there, it is a, decomp a, decomp a decomposer, but I'm not sure which. Mm -hmm. It looks kind of like another hemlock tree, doesn't it, based on the bark? It looks like a hemlock, maybe an oak. I can't quite tell. Yeah, it's a little hard to tell. Yes. Okay, and now we have a few more fungus. <laughs> oh, well, the one that's on the left definitely looks to be probably a decomposing fungus. That looks like it's dead wood it's growing off of. The upper one on the right is an amanita. So that is a mycorrhizal fungus um, associating with the roots of plants. Maybe the, it looks like this could be pitch pines in here. Uh, it would definitely associate with them. And I'm not sure what the fungus is in the lower right-hand shot, but the fungus on the upper right-hand shot is definitely uh you know, a, a mycorrhizal species and the one on the left looks like it's a decomposing species. And both of the ones on the right are growing in a similar pine thatch. I wonder if yeah. they're So it may be the other, one, it, the other one might be mycorrhizal as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, anything else on the fungi? I don't think so. <clears throat> okay. We're in the home stretch now. We have a few more slides to go, and I think we'll have some time for just open Q and A. If folks want to start typing questions in, we can have a more general discussion. We do have about ten minutes left until seven thirty. Okay, so okay. we've got um, a stone fence in the background, some uh, large scattered boulders in the foreground. My initial guess would be this was probably abandoned pasture land, but again, I'd have to see the surface topography of the soil. I can't quite tell if it's lumpy or if it's smooth and even. Um, if it, and it, it was abandoned a good while ago because the trees in the foreground are pretty darn large. The trees in the back side of the wall look a lot younger. So it could be that um, we have two different abandonment periods. Um, but that's what I'm picking up here, unless there were specific questions that the person who took it had. No, this didn't come in with a specific question. But I think that's a really interesting way for for people to kind of investigate the world. If you're if you see a stone wall, look at both sides of it and see if you can notice differences between them. Yeah, and look at the surface topography of the ground and look at the construction of the wall, what type of rocks it's made out of. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All good things to look at. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of clues. Always a lot of clues around there. 
the person who uh, submitted the photo said very rocky, thin soil, sloping, uh, Middletown Springs, Vermont. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, my guess would be pastor, but I have to be on the site to really see. Mm -hmm. Okay, anything else on this one? Or are you ready to move on? Ready to move on, I think. All right. Wow. Now, this is some really, really nice stone work. Um, it looks like it has a megalithic cap. And, you know, I don't know if this is a millwork or what this is. I don't think it's indigenous stone work. I think it's foundation work. Something. So um, the reason I'm thinking millwork is I'm just wondering if water could have been diverted through this thing on the right hand side to come in and run a mill or something. Um, but I guess if there's any other information the person can provide, that might be really helpful. But it's really, really nice stonework. When they sent it in, they said this is in the Catskills near North South Lake, and they said it was in an area where there were former resorts. And so they were hypothesizing this was some kind of a culvert. Um, and you can see the stone is very uniform and flat. I mean, it might could have been a culvert, but this is part of some sort of structure. I mean, it's a bigger thing yeah. than just a culvert. And uh, Curtis is saying it's a retaining wall for an old road that's now a trail. Oh, that could be, I mean, that could be a bridge over that section there that, um, that makes sense. I couldn't see it, but I can see that now that the thing on the right, the road could have gone right over that stone structure. Uh, so yeah, that, that's, that makes sense. But boy, really nice work. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do we have any other questions on this, Brian? Uh, yeah, how does it stay so pristine after over a century? Right, I wouldn't have guessed that it would be that old. Well, um, whoever did it and what they're doing, and they really knew how to lay stone. <laughs> That's one thing I've noticed with stone structures. There's many different skill levels, which oh, yeah. presumably is also related to how much time someone had to work on it. If it was something that they were just heaving rocks out of the pasture so they could get them out of the way versus building a fu functional structure of some kind, like a foundation or a wall. Yeah. And also the type of stone you had to work with. This stone is very regular, so you can really mm. lay it. Very stackable. I think everyone who lives in a place where the rocks are rounded <laughs> envies yeah. this stone a lot. <laughs> yeah. All uh, right. I do have a question related to uh, stone walls. Again, I feel like we're still on the topic. Um, do and This is from somebody in the UK. Do you have wall or ditch and bank indicating property boundaries? In the UK, we find those even in ancient continuously covered woodland. They The walls can um, definitely mark property boundaries, but they weren't built as such. They were built, it's a lot of labor. So they were built to keep livestock in or out of places. So you could also, you know, mark boundaries by blazing trees, driving stakes, all sorts of things. Building a stone structure was a lot of work. But of course, if you had budding farms, there's kind of probably going to be a wall on the boundary between them to keep animals from one farm out of the other farm. <laughs> but they're built for maintaining livestock. Gotcha. I'm chuckling at a question that that, that just hmm. came in. Oh, still related to uh, st stone walls are a hot topic here in the Northeast. Uh, uh, can you comment more on the construction of stone walls? Did they use horses, oxen, large families of teenage sons, uh, <laughs> <laughs> immigrate oh. liver, and how did they lift? Uh, how did they not suffer from herniated discs? <laughs> Well, they they used all those things, yes, and they were good at mechanics. They understood it, and um, you know they they worked at building stonework from young age uh, up through their adulthood. So they had a lot of time to learn how to do this. All right, we have just a couple more slides that were sent in by someone from England, I believe. If you want to look at those, wow, this is really identified cool. as Platinus azurifolia. Oh, well, okay. It's some sort of a sycamore, but um, yeah, it's a tree I'm not familiar with at all. And I, you know, I know the trees in England can grow pretty fast because growing conditions are often good there, but that is an impressive tree. I've never seen anything like it here. 
that's for sure. And I would, can't even tell the diameter of it, but it looks like we're looking at trees that are probably in the five foot range or, you know, something like that. Um, you know, but I know our sycamores here can grow very quickly, so it might not be as old as it might look based on its size. There is a bench in the um, leftmost picture. Yeah. Kind of tells oh, me yeah. that it would be like, yeah, like a pretty good so. diameter. Yeah. Oh, and a question from the photographer. Do you think this is one tree or two or three? Well, it could be a tree that got cut and stump sprouted because um, I'm seeing more than one trunk. Uh, it could be two trees growing side by side, but I'd probably go with stump sprouting. Um, that once there was a good sized tree here, got cut and then sprouted up a number of trunks after being cut. Okay, and the same person sent in a couple more tree photos. Oh, wow. So <laughs> <laughs> I guess this is probably something like a beach or something, I'm guessing. And um, this would be a root clone. So beaches do root clone. So this one on the left, all those above ground things are all one individual that just cloned off of one root system. Um, so quite, quite dramatic um so i'm guessing it is a beach of some sort and this one on the right has branches just going off in all different directions yeah it's really pretty contorted and i'd have to see more of it to try to figure out what happened to it there but it's definitely contorted yeah are there any other questions on this brian this is our last slide um, not coming in at the moment, um, but I'll let you know if anything comes on on it. We do have one general question. So it is 728 and we are slated to go to 730. So I don't want to take up uh, too much of Tom's time, but um, uh, oh, re, uh, related to this, um, Julie, can you see the q and I'm not going to try to pronounce the Latin name. That's not my... Uh... Uh, hang on, let me stop sharing so we can get back here. Um, oh, they're both Vegas Sylvatica. Huh? So a, a European beach, right? European beach. And like I said, beaches do root clone. So that's what that one on the left was doing. It's just one individual. The root came out and all these, you know, root clones grew up off of it. Beaches are very enthusiastic about existing, I've noticed. When you know, now that we're getting so much beach bark disease and other issues, they're just the clonal sprouts are just so dense. Well, that's it. I mean, if they start failing above ground, then they just send up new sprouts. Yeah. System. Uh, one question that we've had uh, lingering uh, is kind of a more general question. So I was holding it to the end um, about pawpaw trees. I've heard that pawpaw trees are native to the Northeast, but I've never seen one in the wild. Do you know if there are any of these trees living in the Not Northeast? I, know of. I mean, I, I, I know of them being native to further South, but I don't know of them being native up here. No. I know there's at least a few because I know someone who came to a potluck once with a pawpaw pudding from a tree that grew right near her house. So I, I think they can grow here, but they aren't terribly common. I haven't encountered them, but I, you know, I, I know that they do occur commonly further south. So we could be at right where you are at their very northern range limits. That's I, I think that's what it is. We're just at the very edge of their range. So they can exist here, but you don't see a lot and they don't necessarily thrive here. Okay. And with that, um, we are at 730. So uh, we don't have any more questions coming in at the moment. I'm sure if we hung around, we would. But uh, Tom, I don't want to uh, usurp all of your time here. Uh, but yeah, lots of thank yous coming in, um, especially from our individual who uh, is visiting from the other side of the Atlantic. Chris, thank you for all your comments and photos. Uh, really, really cool stuff. So yeah, thank you, Tom. And thank you to everyone who attended tonight. We'll be sending a follow-up email with information on uh, Tom's books, uh, links to helpful resources, and the link to the recording of this webinar as well. Uh, and we want to remind you that next month on Wednesday, January 10th, can't believe it'll be a new year, 
Uh, this will be the second Wednesday instead of the first due to the New Year's holiday that we'll be doing our webinar. Uh, our speaker will be Dave Strayer, retired freshwater ecologist from the Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies, our neighbors. Uh, who'll talk about the past and future of the Hudson River, and we hope to see you all there. And Tom, again, just thank thank you so much. What a thank cool you, Tom. Format. My pleasure. Nice way to spend an early part of an evening. It there sure is. I think we could probably have a long, long conversation about all of these things, but we don't want to be here till midnight. So we'll just yeah. send everybody <laughs> off to read your books. <laughs> right. Well, bye bye, all. All right. Thank you, Tom. Have a good night, thank everyone. Thank you, Tom. Good night, everyone.